Hello and welcome back everyone to Zoos Victoria's Conservation Conversations. My name is Dr. Marissa Parrott and I'm the reproductive biologist here at Zoos Victoria. Before anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Gunai Kurnai people of the Kulin Nation. Usually I'd be calling in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, but I'm actually out in the field at the moment working with our wildlife. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all listening in from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. Welcome. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land, waters and communities of Australia. Welcome to our audience tonight, our conservation partners, our bequest supporters, donors, animal adopters, our valued members and our very special guests. I've been extremely lucky to work with Tasmanian devils in the lab, in the wild and in our captive breeding program for around 12 years. And tonight I'm joined by our fabulous coordinator of threatened mammals at Hillsville Sanctuary, Monica Zabinskis, who's worked with devils for over 10 years now, and with our wonderful conservation detection dog officer, Dr. Latoya Jamison, who's worked with detection dogs for around seven years now. Tonight, we have a wealth of knowledge to share with you and information on a very exciting world first trial for conservation. I'm so pleased that we could start our webinar tonight with those beautiful devil voices because it's something I absolutely love. Those little sniffs and snorts, the little noise they make arf, in the wild, and of course, those rather ear splitting screams. And it's actually because of those screams that they got their name, the devil. When white settlers first went to Tasmania, they heard the devils calling in the night. And they said the only thing that could make such an awful noise must be a devil. Add to that that little devil's ears go bright red if they're stressed or excited and they look like little devil horns and you've got the makings of a very devilish name. But while they're Tasmanian devils, they weren't always only found in Tasmania. They were actually here on the mainland until around 3000 years ago based on the fossil record. At that time, devils were across Australia, but with an increase in the indigenous population and dingoes, there was more competition and hunting and they were driven to extinction. But they had a wonderful stronghold in Tassie until of course those white settlers arrived. The settlers thought that devils and their very close cousins, the Tassie tigers or thylacines, were killing their livestock. There was a bounty put on their heads even though in the end it wasn't them killing the livestock at all, it was likely the settlers own dogs. The Tasmanian tiger was hunted to extinction. The last one died in a zoo in Hobart in 1936. His name was Benjamin. And with his death, there was a huge hole left in Australia's wildlife biodiversity. The Tassie devil nearly went the same way until about 1940 when biologists realized that they weren't causing these issues and actually their numbers were collapsing. The bounty was lifted and they were given protection and their numbers started to increase again to the point where they were considered common and you could hear those little voices calling in the dark. It's extremely important that we still have our devils. They're the top order predator along with the wedge-tailed eagle in Tasmania. That means they regulate their ecosystems and they protect all of the other species, other mammals and birds, reptiles, frogs, invertebrates, even the plants around them. They're crucially important. Ecosystem angels, if you will. They also play another very important role out in the wild in Tasmania. They're scavengers. They can travel kilometers to find a kill. They can smell them from kilometers away. They can travel 20 Ks in a night. But like other famous scavengers, like hyenas, for example, they're actually very good hunters as well. They hunt for small animals like frogs and birds, and even for animals larger than themselves like wallabies and wombats. Devils have extremely strong teeth and jaws. In fact, they have the strongest bite force per body weight of any mammal in the entire world. They can bite straight through bone. They eat hide. 
They come together to kill with other devils and they work together to pull a kill apart so they can eat the best bits and everything that's left too. A devil can actually eat 40% of its own body weight in one sitting. This is something I try and do every Christmas myself and am yet to even get close to, but Christmas is coming, so I will be trying again. When devils eat that much, they then don't need to eat again for days and can sleep it off in their dens. They really are amazing animals. So these voices and these carcass killings and eating was common across Tasmania until 1996, when another major threat arose. A photographer first took a photo of a devil at Wakalina or Mount William on the northeast coast with a horrific tumour on its face. This is what we came to know as devil facial tumour disease. Over the next few years, the disease spread across devils and biologists and the government started to see these horrific tumours popping up. In 2003, the first task force for devil facial tumour disease was formed. But by that stage, the disease had traveled across around 25 to 30% of Tasmania. It was out of control. The disease has now traveled across about 97% of Tasmania with only pockets not affected in the far Northwest and Southwest, as well as specially protected disease-free locations like Mariah Island and the Tasman Peninsula, which are protected from devils with the disease and were populated with disease-free quarantine devils from the captive breeding program. Across the areas with DFTD, around 80% of devils are now gone. There haven't been any local extinctions, but in populations, more than 97% of devils have been lost. This isn't just a problem for the devils, but also for all of those other species that rely on them because the devils regulate that ecosystem. As the numbers of devils decrease, introduced predators like cats, for example, increase in number or they increase the amount of activity they're doing at night when other mammals, native mammals, are active. In areas with fewer devils, the numbers of eastern quolls have plummeted by about 50% and eastern quolls have now recently joined the Tasmanian devil on the endangered species list beautiful little native rodents like the New Holland mouse that I particularly love haven't been seen in Tasmania in over a decade. It's crucially important that we protect the devils and that helps to protect all the other species too out in the wild. In areas with the disease, we not only see that the numbers of devils have decreased but also the age of devils. In the wild, devils generally lived for about five to six years. In captivity, it's seven to eight years but in areas with the disease, it's generally only to two years old. They manage to breed once before they succumb to the disease and they don't live any longer. So what is devil facial tumor disease? Well, it's actually a transmissible form of cancer. There are only five of them known in the world. They're very unusual. And two of them occur in devils. Devil facial tumor disease one, which was discovered in 1996, and devil facial tumor disease two, which was discovered about six years ago in the southern part of Tasmania. And there's a lot we don't know, particularly about that second one, which is major, majorly concerning for devils and their conservation. Transmissible forms of cancer are very unusual. They're passed by direct contact in the devils. So a devil with a tumor on its face might have cells from that cancer coating its teeth and they'll come together to kill or to mate and they'll bite one another or a devil that's healthy might buy, bite a tumor of a devil that's unhealthy because it's the biggest thing to grab. It's like injecting the cells with a hypodermic syringe and they start to grow. Within three to six months of showing tumors, the devil is likely to die. It's a horrific way of dying. The tumors grow mostly on the face because that's where most of the bites are, but they can be in other areas. It means as they grow, the devil can't eat or they can't see or in 60% of the cancer cases, the tumors metastasize. That means they travel through the devil's system and take up residence in places like their organs. They grow so quickly that they take all of the energy and the devil dies from organ failure. It is absolutely horrific to see in the wild, which is why we're doing so much to try and protect those devils. 
Originally, it was thought that because devils went through what we call a genetic bottleneck, so very few devils, for example, in 1940, when they were hunted nearly to extinction, that devils couldn't tell the cells of another devil from their own, so the disease could start to grow. But amazing work by teams at the University of Tasmania, Menzies Institute and the Save the Tassie Devil program found that actually the devil's immune system was fully functional and they could tell the cells from other devils. What they found just in the last decade was that the, the cancer is extremely clever and sneaky. It's actually turned off the markers on the outside of its cell so it can slip through the devil system without being detected, a little bit like an invisibility cloak in Harry Potter. Once that disease takes hold, there's nothing we can do. While there have been fantastic advances in work in labs, there still isn't a workable cure or a vaccine for Tasmania devil facial tumour disease, but there have been those great advances and we're always hopeful that something might be found. That's why it's so important that we're working with our partners like the Save the Tasmanian Devil program, the Zoo and Aquarium Association to try and protect the devils and find out as much as we can about them. We work in the lab with the University of Tasmania and Deakin to look at whether there might be a disease resistance or tolerance forming in the devils. It would be the best thing possible that they can mount their own defense. We haven't seen it yet and no recovery, but there are signs that maybe in the future we can find something and we can use that to help the devils. We work with partners at Monash Uni to look at diet and behavior and toothwear to make sure we're doing everything right in the crucially important breeding program. We work with vets and pathologists looking at devil health. Out in the wild, one of my favorite projects is working with the Carnivore Conservancy and National Geographic on criticams. These are specially designed collars with cameras on them so that we can learn more about the devils out in the wild because they're shy, they're cryptic, they're nocturnal, they live in remote areas and they den underground. It's really hard to know what those natural behaviors are when people aren't around, but these special cameras can tell us and they can make sure that our program is having the best natural behaviors possible at places like Hills Hill Sanctuary and our partners. It also tells us about the devil's road use because road mortality is the second biggest cause of death in devils. So if you are in Tasmania, please do be very careful looking for wildlife on our roads and of course anywhere in Australia as well. We then of course have the crucial captive breeding program across Australia and Tasmania, an insurance program to protect the devil, to manage their genetics and to make sure that if something does go wrong in Tassie or if we find a vaccine and we can put devils back out, that we have special healthy devils that can help the wild population. At Hillsville Sanctuary, our insurance program involves breeding the devils and research, and we've been very successful. Monica, I know you're on the line there. Can you tell us how many devils we've bred at Hillsville Sanctuary and how we went this year? Thanks, Maurice. Um, we've had such a bumpy year this year. We've bred 17 devils this year, which has brought our total so far to 172. 172 endangered devils. That is just so exciting and something that I know our team is really proud of. And I'm going to hand over to Monica now to tell you all about devil breeding and how we care for devils at Hillsville Sanctuary. Thanks, Mon. Thanks, Marissa. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Monica. And as Marissa said, I'm the coordinator of our threatened mammals team at Hillsville Sanctuary. So I have been working with devils for over 10 years now, um, amongst some other endangered species out at Hillsville. Um, and my role at Hillsville is uh, both a zookeeper on the ground, but also overseeing um, our husbandry and operations of some of our most threatened species. So I have a really rewarding job. So today I'm going to talk to you guys all about devil breeding um, and what we've been doing at Hillsville over the past 10 years. Or, or more actually. Um, and so uh, back in um, 2006 was when we joined the Save the Tasmanian Devil program, uh, when the insurance program was at its inception back then. And in 2008 um, was when we had our first founders come in from the wild. Um, and it was also when we had our first Joey born to, cap to wild founders, which was called Yoga Bar. And a huge thank you and shout out to um, the Yoga Bar Foundation for their ongoing support um, in the programs uh, for Tasmanian Devils at Hillsville. 
And so Tasmanian devil breeding is absolutely fascinating. It's, uh, it's both challenging and rewarding, um, and I'm forever learning more and more as I work with these species every day. Um, and so with Tasmanian devil breeding, Marissa touched on it before, and they are a marsupial, so just like kangaroos and koalas, the females do have a pouch, and they've got four teats inside that pouch. But when they give birth, they actually give birth to about 30 joeys at a time. So those joeys are about the size of a grain of rice, really tiny, really underdeveloped and it's survival of the fittest for the four strongest grains of rice to make their way into the pouch and attach onto one of mum's four teats. So once they're in that pouch they stay there till they're about three and a half months old, four months old, just drinking milk. Then they get to that point where they're a bit too big uh, in mum's pouch anymore, they might be just hanging out by legs and tails um, and then they start to either be carried around on mum's back or be left in a burrow or a den. And then at five months of age, roughly, they'll start um, eating meat, first chewing on the hide and the skin, um, and then they uh, stay with mum right up until they're about eight to ten months of age, drinking milk and feeding um, on meat as well. At that point, they start to separate from mum and become a solitary devil out there in the wild, just coming across other devils, as Marissa, Marissa mentioned before, um, when they're meeting each other over feeds or when it's breeding season. But how do we get to that point? And then on top of that, how do we do that in captivity? Um, it's a real challenge. These guys are typically solitary animals most of the time. And so it's not as simple as just housing the males and females together and we'll get all these 172 babies. Um, and it's just been super rewarding working out all those intricacies of how we breed them over the time I've been at Hillsville. I'm going to hopefully um, tell you guys a little bit about that and give a bit of a snapshot of what's involved. So Tasmanian devils um, breed typically for about six months of the year in the start of their breeding season. So the females can come into estrus in about January, sometimes it's February or even March. Um, and then they can cycle three times throughout the year, very rarely sometimes four. And those cycles are about 55 to 60 days apart. Um, and so obviously they'll come into that next cycle if they haven't been successful in that first one. Um, but when they're coming into that estrus cycle, uh, it can be, this might sound a little bit caveman-like, a little bit brutal, um, but it is all super fascinating and interesting. So what happens is the female, when she comes into her estrus cycle, um, actually develops a fat roll uh, on the back of her neck between her shoulder blades. And this is where the male, when we introduce them, will actually bite that region of her neck and then drag her into a burrow or a den. Um, sounds pretty horrible, but it's quite interesting. And so once he takes her back into the den, he'll then actually dig the whole front of the den entrance, plug it with uh, grass and dirt and things like that, um, and not let the female out of the den. Um, sounds a little bit horrible, but um, the reason that they do that is the female will actually be in estrus for about seven to ten days. She won't ovulate till the very end of that cycle. So if the male will mate with her and then leaves that den during that time and disappears and she's still in estrus, another male may come along and end up siring um, the young. And that's actually how sometimes there's multiple paternities in litters in the wild. So the male will often mate guard um, and actually lay there um, and stop the female from getting out. Neither of the animals will eat during this time. So they'll need to have had a really big feed beforehand. Uh, luckily, the females actually tend to go off food during this time, but the males need to have had a nice good feed before, before that time. So uh, once that female is out of her estrus cycle, then that male nicks off and, and she boots him out of the place. So in captivity sometimes, particularly if we've got some young boys, they stick around a little bit too long um, and maybe get a bit told off by that female once she's out of estrus. There's a tiny romantic side where um, the male will leave the den, squeeze through that little opening that he's left there, go out and uh, collect mouthfuls of grass. So usually ripping up tussock grasses, lamandras, things like that, and take them back in and just cover her with bedding. I'm not sure if it makes up for dragging her over all the logs and sticks to begin with, um, but it's really fascinating. And he will do that and then he'll sit there and actually lick that area of the neck that he was biting in that beginning. Um, and it's quite fascinating. It's as little as 21 days later that uh, the female will, will give birth to those grains of rice. So um, really short gestation, quite common with a lot of marsupials, but then most of that development will, of course, happen in the pouch as they're developing later on. But how do we actually know when to put them together? It's really quite challenging. So um, there's little things that we will watch and look for. So I mentioned before that the female goes off food and that's a really big sign to us that she might be coming into estrus. It's also a sign when they're going through their birthing period as well. Um, so that can be a great cue for us, but there's also things like that fat buildup behind the neck, 
um, and uh, just other behavioural changes that we look for. So we want monitor things via cameras a lot so that we can be as hands off as we can. And we're looking for things like, is there a behaviour change with the male? Is he digging along a fence line towards the female? Has she all of a sudden changed her behaviour and she's out more often at a time that's not normal for her? Or has she completely become subdued and not, not coming out at all? All of those things are little, little bits and pieces that we use to, um, to give us cues of, of how we might introduce these animals. Over time and generations in captivity, some of those cues are becoming harder and harder to pick up on. Um, some of the females tend to eat a little bit more through, through those cycles, um, which is by making it a little bit more challenging for us to, to pick those points of when the most appropriate time is to introduce the devils. Maybe it might sound like that doesn't really matter, but they're only in estrus for seven to 10 days. And it's that third day that they come into estrus that we know from, um, from all of our records and, and watching these animals over the years that that's the best time to introduce them to have the best chance of success. So it's really challenging through our breeding season, picking up on all of these little things and making sure we choose the right time to introduce these animals. Um, and so, but of course, it's not all, um, it's not all breeding. There's a lot of other things that we do. Marissa touched on um, or mentioned some of those uh, research programs that we've been involved in and um, and I've been really lucky to, to help with a lot of those over my time at Hillsville um, and a big part of what we do with the breeding program and with the, with the animals that we have at the sanctuary which is about 50 at the moment is a really broad enrichment program um, and a really detailed way that we um, feed our devils at the sanctuary so Marissa mentioned about that that gorge feeding that they can do um, and typically in a lot of um, captive environments when you've got a gorge feeder or when you've got um, carnivores you might feed them daily or every second day or give them gorge opportunities um, uh, every now and then. And we did some research where we were really looking at um, what was that uh, best way to feed devils? Is it feeding them daily and giving them starves? And then we, we looked at what, do we, what happens if we really give them that gorge starve regime where they get huge portions of food, um, eat as much as they possibly can and then have multiple starve days after that, uh, exactly how they'd feed in the wild. And we found that the, it was so interesting. Their behaviours um, were more naturalistic. They didn't fluctuate as much in, um, in their weight ranges. Uh, you didn't see as much anticipatory behaviour when, when it was approaching feed times. Um, and it really told us that this is the way that we should be feeding the entire population that we have at the sanctuary. And, and so that's what we've adopted for everyone. Um, and when it comes to our enrichment, what we do here is uh, there is a whole range of different things that we do to try and um, uh, to uh, allow the, the devils to, to showcase case all sorts of different behaviours that they would naturally do in the wild. Something that's always surprised me is how amazing these animals are at climbing trees. Joeys will climb trees as thick as your thumb, um, but even adults are actually really agile and they will hug a tree um, and just shimmy up the tree. And um, as much as, you know, we obviously need to be careful that we're, um, that we have enclosures that um, are safe um, and that they can't climb trees and and injure themselves or get out, it also showed us that this is a behaviour we really want to be encouraging in the population. So how do we provide lots of opportunities for these animals to climb trees and show all these different behaviours that, um, that they definitely really want to do? All sorts of different food-based enrichment. We, um, we like to not waste anything at the same so if anyone uh, listening has um, been to Hillsville Sanctuary, you might see our bird show, our Spirits of the Sky show. Some of those birds of prey are so fussy with uh, little bits of food that they leave behind and we don't want to waste anything. So we ask the keepers on that team, collect everything, give it to us. We make it into delicious ice blocks or blend it up with some blood and things and, and make smears out of it. Sounds a little bit disgusting, but putting that around a Tasmanian devil enclosure, encouraging them to use that foraging sense that they're so good at um, is, is really great ways for us to enrich their life at Hillsville. Um, and things like in the middle of summer, freezing big, um, big ice blocks for them and giving them lots of different things that they can explore is really um, is, is a lot of what um, myself and my team do um, at Hillsville. But as you can imagine, um, all of those traits getting back to, to the breeding program, um, uh, the shyness of devils, how elusive they can be. Um, also, when they're coming into their, their breeding, uh, their um, birthing phase, so something I didn't mention just before, what I've always found so interesting about devils is um, they actually pseudo birth. So whether the female is pregnant or not, she will go through what looks like um, actual birthing, where she will go through the contractions, um, be off her food, everything exactly the same, whether she has young or not. Um, sucks to be a female 
Devil. Uh, but we have we've monitored over the years, having cameras in different dens, and we can really pick the exact time that that, that birthing will be. Um, unfortunately, because it can be pseudo birthing, watching that doesn't actually tell us that that female has pouch yarn. So given that we know in about 55 days from the start of estrus, she might come into estrus again. We wait until those joeys um, would be as big as they could be just before she might come into estrus again if she wasn't successful and that's when we do a pouch check. So we'll have a look inside her pouch and see if she has any joeys. They'd be about 25 days old at that point and be about the size of a jelly bean. Um, and if she doesn't have any young at that point, then we know, okay, maybe that first male wasn't the best choice for her, or we have a look and, um, and in about five to 10 days time, she'll come into estrus again and we can let a different boy in and, and have another shot. Or if she has pouch young, we let her alone, leave her alone, um, start looking at all the things we need to do for, for lactation and all the other changes that we might do with looking after her um, and let her raise her young on her own. So all of these bits and pieces um, are just a little snapshot of all the things that we need to think about and look at with Tasmanian devil breeding, um, but they're really challenging and uh, we really want to be as hands off as we can when we're working with any of our animals um, at Zoos Victoria, but also particularly for these endangered species that we want to, um, you know, we want to be keeping as wild as we can. Um, and so when we started to think of, well, what can we do that's even more hands off with some of these animals? And, and you can imagine if you're a mum that's just had some babies, um, you don't want to really uh, have your pouch checked. And maybe there's a different way that we can do that to be a little bit more hands off. And we started to think, well, male devils look at all sorts of different cues that um, that the female is, is giving to help them know when they come into estrus. Um, Maybe we can use uh, dogs to do the same thing. And that's where we um, thought, well, let's get involved with some detection dogs. Um, and that gives me a perfect segue to, uh, for Latoya to take over and um, tell you guys all about our amazing detection dog program. Thank you, Mon. So I'm Latoya. I'm one of the wildlife detection dog officers at Zoos Victoria. And I'm lucky enough to be working in the Tasmanian Devil Estrus and Lactation Detection Project with some of our detection dogs. So Mon was actually the first person who approached myself and my colleague Naomi on our very first day at work saying that she would love if we had detection dogs that could de um, detect when female Tasmanian devils have given birth, as well as when they are in estrus, so we can better um, time the pairing of the male and the female. And that might sound like quite a crazy idea. You may often think that detection dogs are simply in airports detecting contraband, or hopefully are also in the fields detecting wildlife. But detection dogs have actually been used for a lot of um, more subtle odors. So in the medical detection field, detection dogs are actually locating cancer cells and sometimes can actually detect whether a person has cancer sooner than um, more advanced technological methods, which is fascinating. And more recently, dogs are actually being trained to detect COVID-19 from a variety of different samples. So we know that dogs are able to detect really subtle signatures within a variety of different samples. So at Zoos Victoria, we have an in-house wildlife detection dog program which is based at Hillsville Sanctuary. And this program has two main arms. So one of our arms is our fighting extinction detection dog squad. And that is our team of detection dogs that will be deployed in the field and that will help us monitor some of Victoria's threatened species. And our other arm is all about research. So we have a team of privately owned dogs that are used on a variety of different um, novel research projects. And it is this arm of detection dogs that we will hope will help us determine whether or not detection dogs can actually tell us when a female is in estrus and when a female is lactating and is therefore given birth to her litter of joeys. So as Mon was saying, there can be um, quite a few challenges with determining whether a female Tasmanian devil is in estrus and is ready to pair. So this will hopefully help us better determine when we should be pairing our female Tasmanian devils and may hopefully result in um, greater breeding success with the females. And it also allows us to have more of a hands-off approach with how we are monitoring our females. So in order to determine this, we've selected six very special dogs 
to help us with this project. So these dogs are from a variety of backgrounds. We have rescue dogs that are Kelpie crosses, Coolie crosses, and even a little Papillon cross Corgi. And then we also have some purebreds. We have a Legotto Romanolo, as well as an Irish Terrier. And these dogs range in three to nine years of age and have all different quirks and personalities. But what makes them all special and really helpful for a project like ours is that they're all very highly food motivated or toy motivated. And they also all have experience in detection work. So whether that's in research projects, detecting tiger, red panda and black buck scat, or if that's actually out in the fields where they're surveying wind farms or detecting freshwater turtle nests. So these dogs have been split up into two groups. One group is detecting the estra samples and the other group is detecting lactation samples. And these samples that we're training on is actually the feces or the scat of the female Tasmanian devils at Hillsville Sanctuary. And training on these samples means that we're able to get quite a large um, amount of samples in order to train the dogs. And it also means that the devils and dogs don't ever have to come into contact in order to, for the dogs to actually detect estrus or lactation, which of course is very important. So we're currently training um, the two dogs, Naomi and myself, over the last four months. And we train them because of COVID actually in our own backyards. But ideally, we'd be training these dogs in quite an environmentally controlled area. But you know what? We, we do what we can. So the dogs at the moment are being trained on what we call a scent wheel. And the scent wheel is basically a carousel which houses up to 12 different samples. And with each arm of that carousel is a number. So we can always track where our target sample is um, and we can also move them without having to ever actually touch the samples, which is very important for contamination. Um, and all of our dogs are trained using food as a reward or, and also toy as a reward at the end of their training sessions. So the training sessions start out being really short. So we want these sessions to be really fun um, so the dogs enjoy it and that makes them learn as quickly as they can. So the sessions start out just being a couple of minutes and down the track they work up to about 15 minutes. And our whole goal is to having these dogs working at Hillsville Sanctuary so we can in very um, short periods of time alert the keepers to whether or not they should be pairing a female with um, her suitable male or whether they've actually successfully given birth which are two obviously very exciting things. Um, so hopefully Tess can now share a video of uh, our training over the last four months and it will show sure. a lot of work in two and a half minutes. So this is actually my dog Arwen on her very second day of training. So here she is um, finding the Tasmanian Devil's scat on the scent wheel and this is during the odour imprinting phase. So she's simply being rewarded for approaching the target scat and doing her alert behaviour, which is a sit. So this is a very important stage in getting the dogs to learn what their target sample is, as well as getting really comfortable with the training uh, material, because as you can imagine, scent wheels aren't everywhere. So this is Ziggy on day four of training, and we've now included more pots on the wheel. So he has to independently search around the scent wheel and locate the target pot which for him is lactation um, and do his alert and then he gets his reward and a nice game of fetch. Now this is little Cisco on day six. So we've amped up the challenges here. There's now the exact same individual scat on the wheel, which is also the same individual as the target. So for this, it was licorice's scat, which Cisco just incorrectly alerted to and licorice's scat is also the target. So it's quite challenging. And this is little Koopy. So this is Cooper on day eight of training. And this is when we start doing blind searches. So that means that the dog handler doesn't know where the target is. So the dog is completely relying on its sense of smell in order to locate it. Now, unfortunately, because we are working outdoors, environmental conditions can move the odor. So in that case, the wind was blowing the, um, the sample odor to the next pot, which is what Cooper was alerting at. 
Now this is Kipper, he is detecting estrus. And this is when we also start introducing blind, um, blank runs where there's none on the wheel. But this one was a correct estrus um, sample, which is why Kip got his reward. But those blank searches are really important because in the real world, there's not always going to be a target. And this is finally Daisy just last week leaping into action. And she's also detecting estrus. And now this is a sample that she has never been trained on before. And the wheel is also full of other novel non-targets. So this is an incredibly exciting moment because it's showing that not only are the dogs alerting to the samples they've been trained on, but they're also generalizing to the um, novel samples. So there must be something quite um, distinguishable in the Tasmanian Devil Scat, which says um, I'm estrus or I am lactation, which is fascinating. But this training has been very challenging because this is quite literally a world first. We don't believe that there's ever been another detection dog project which has explored using detection dogs to detect estrus or lactation in a wild species. We're kind of um, figuring out a lot of things as we go. So we don't actually know what from the target scats the dogs are alerting to. So just like with the medical detection dogs that I was talking about, we don't know if the dogs in those studies are alerting to the cancer cells themselves or if they're alerting to the change in the body which has um, been caused by the cancer. So that's why we've partnered with La Trobe University who are completing the hormone analyses on the scat samples. And we also have a wonderful honours student who is also completing the research on evaluating the benefits of using detection dogs as um, this method, as well as the hormone analysis and the keeper behavioural observations, which Monica was talking about. So we're hoping that in the next few months, when our project is um, wrapping up, that we'll be able to have a better idea of how successful these methods are, both as a standalone method, as well as a complementary method. And no detection method is ever 100% accurate. So it's likely that the best um, result for our captive detect devil program is to use a combination of all of these methods. So you can have greater confidence in these outcomes. Another challenge that we've had with our training is the amount of samples. So as Monica was saying before, there's basically a three day window. So on day three is when you're wanting to pair females with the males in order to breed. So which means that we only have approximately three samples to train on per individual. And with a limited amount of females breeding each year, that's left us with less than 15 training samples, which in the broad scheme of things for detection dog training, it's really not much. So we're hoping that in next year's breeding season, not only will we be having dogs um, at Healesville detecting when the females are in estrus and also lactating, but we'll also be able to collect more scat samples, which in itself is quite a time consuming process. So to do that, scat samples are collected over several months and stored, stored individually in sterile containers until the female is given birth. And then at that stage, we can backtrack and determine exactly what samples belong where. So whether they're going to be our target samples or whether they're going to be our non-target samples, which are basically um, samples that fall um, outside of those two very specific time windows. So if this method is successful, it could be applied to not only um, captive Tasmanian doubles, but it could also be appropriate for a lot of other captive species. So hopefully watch this space and we hope that in the next few months we'll have some exciting results about our Tasmanian devil, estrus and lactation detection dogs. So that wraps up this section of the webinar. We now open the Q&A session, so please feel free to send through any questions that you may have and we'll always do our best to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Latoya and Monica too. That was brilliant. And I just love that video. And little Cooper, it's just fabulous. He's such we a have star. Already, he's such a star. They all are. <laughs> We've had some questions come through already. So I'm just going to read out some questions that are starting to come through. Do keep sending them on through. The first one is for Monica. And it's devil breeding is very interesting. Do you have a favorite part of the breeding program? 
Oh, do I have a favourite part of the breeding program? I mean, there's so many bits that are amazing. Um, but one of the bits that, uh, like a story that I that has always stuck with me over the years is, um, as you can imagine, often we are trying to breed with individuals that behaviourally might not love each other, but um, genetically they're the best match to put together. And I remember this particular year where we had this quite young male, Tommy, um, and he didn't have any experience yet. And we were pairing him with a pretty feisty girl, Ali, um, and she had had experience breeding, but genetically they were a really, really good match. Um, and so anyway, we, we thought we'll give it a go. Um, we'll put them together. Everything was going okay. Um, and then he had her in the den and just disappeared out in the enclosure. And we just saw her face pop out and she just backed in and we're sitting there silently behind the fence, just watching, just like, come on, what are you doing? You need to get back in there. And he just kept pulling mouthfuls of grass out of everywhere, but he hadn't done anything with the female yet. He wasn't in the den with her yet. Um, and uh, he just starts carrying more and more and more grass in. And we had a camera inside that den and the camera is sort of pointing towards the back of the den. So you can see the female devil and, um, uh, sorry, pointing to the pipe. So you can actually see him coming back in with all of the bedding. And I just remember sitting there in the camera room watching and you just see Tommy um, just with mouthfuls of bedding and we didn't have sound, but you can just see the female's mouth opening and opening. And he just was staring back kind of like he was looking at the camera and just like, woman, I know I need to get you all of this grass. I don't know why, why are you screaming at me? And then it was just this like light bulb moment and he just went scruffed her, which is that term when we were talking about biting that area of the back of the neck. Um, and uh, just everything worked well. Um, and he, the female went to date and he um, ended up being a proud dad of four little joeys. And it was just really hilarious and fascinating. And just every different pairing we do is really interesting. And it did, um, it did remind me of uh, uh, just some of the things we do before we actually pair animals together. So um, I won't talk for too much on this, but um, I didn't mention before that, you know, we, before we actually hit our breeding season, when we get um, our recommendations, so we'll have all of our females and males that we're going to breed with. And obviously you can't breed everyone together. We'll have genetics that need to be put together. And um, when we've got animals that are paired genetically as really good matches, there's a few things that we do um, to set ourselves up for the best success. And that's switching fecals between individuals so they get to introduce each other before um, we put them together. Uh, but then sometimes we'll also let the devils together uh, for what we call a pre estrus introduction just for 20 minutes. Uh, this gives for two different reasons. It allows the male to explore that female's enclosure, look at all the different areas and, um, and basically get to know the space so that then when he gets in there next time, um, he hopefully isn't distracted by all the shiny things um, and then just gets down to business. Um, and, but it also tells us whether if the female and the male are going to behaviorally work okay together. Um, and interestingly, you know, when I think back at what happened with Tommy, um, it was a second estrus introduction and we weren't able to do that pre estrus introduction and learn a bit more about behavior, um, which might've told us that he maybe wouldn't have had the confidence necessarily with that female. But it all turned out in that instance, but yeah, just, I could talk for hours about breeding, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Mom, that's brilliant. I've got some more questions. Um, I'm going to amalgamate two that um, have come through that I can answer. What is the most difficult part of working in the wild? And have you had any experiences with Tasmanian devils that have really surprised you or amazed you? So working with devils in the wild is a fabulous experience. There are quite a few difficulties. We do have to make sure we have a lot of permits and licenses. Everything is recorded and everything is tested by the Tasmanian government and our partners. We make sure that we follow very strict biosecurity as well. So we all wear coveralls and plastic aprons. Everything we touch is disinfected with veterinary grade disinfectant. And of course, we're very careful with the devils and with our own safety to keep everyone safe and comfortable because they do have very large teeth and jaws. And while they are actually a delight to handle, they do have those big teeth that you have to watch out for. But one of the most difficult bits that did surprise and amaze me and one of my favourite stories is from a big male I worked with in the wild named Usher. And he's my favourite devil out in the wild. Now, when you set devil traps, they're very big, they're heavy, and we put them out in the wild very carefully. It takes a lot of time, as Monica knows, she's been out trapping with us in the wild. And you put out the trap with food at one end connected to a string and the devil walks in, pulls on the food and a pin pulls out and the little door closes behind them. 
they settle down, eat their food and wait for you to go and check their health in the morning and let them go. Well, we set out 30 traps and 11 of the traps we got to were closed, which is great, but there were no devils and there was no food. And we thought, was someone messing with our traps? Well, during this trip, I was working with our amazing partners from the Carnivore Conservancy and National Geographic on the Criticam trial that I mentioned earlier. And we had a big boy usher, very large devil, wearing his special collar overnight. He's what we called a frequent flyer devil, one that we saw all the time. So we knew if we popped the collar on, we could get it back the next day. And when we took his little collar off and looked at it, there was Usher going to the first trap, sneaking in very carefully, grabbing that bit of food, backing up, and then grabbing the door with his foot so that he could sneak off with the food and hide it. Then he went to the second trap and the third and the fourth and the 10th and the 11th before we finally caught him. So he actually learnt how to undo all our hard work and beat us at our own game. And so that's why he's my favorite, because you have to respect a devil that can outthink the traps like that and get away with it. He really was very clever. Now, the third question we've got here is for Latoya, and it is, do you have a favorite detection dog program helping animals? Oh, that's a tough one, because there are so many. I think one of my favorite ones is actually an international project. They actually have a small team of detection dogs that are locating killer whale scat. So no, they don't just send the dogs off to swim around and hopefully stumble across it. They have these amazing dogs in boats and based on the dog's body language, they steer the boat in that direction. And then when they're getting quite close to the target, the handler is so in tune with their dog that they're actually looking at which nostril is working because you may or may not know, but the dogs can use each nostril independently. So when they're getting quite close, suddenly they find the scat sample and the dogs get a massive reward. And I think it's just an incredible way of working with detection dogs. So that would have to be the favorite at the moment. That is brilliant. It's just amazing what dogs can do to help animals, to help people everywhere. We've got two questions that have come through that are quite similar for Monica. Uh, so I'll amalgamate those ones as well. One of them is, have you released devils from Hillsville Sanctuary to the wild? And when releasing devils into the wild, are equal numbers of males and females released? Um, yes, we have released devils back into the wild. Um, in 2013, 15, 17 and 19, I believe. Um, and uh, that was a 13 devils across that time um, to areas such as Mariah Island um, and Forestier Peninsula. And it was really exciting that some of our females that were released over those years, we know through the trapping that Save the Tasmanian Devil Program have done, uh, monitoring them after that, have had young. Um, and so that was just brilliant. As the keepers working at Hillsville, breeding some of these devils and then getting them back out in the wild and hearing that they've reproduced out there was just, um, yeah, really, really great um, to, to know that, you know, your work's paying off. Um, and uh, so when it comes to equal ratio of males to females, that probably does change depending on what's happening with that release. So in the releases that we've done, um, uh, it's sort of been a mixture and based more around uh, age classes and genetics and things, but um, uh, we don't tend to get to make that decision. You might have a bit, bit more to say around some of those releases with males and females, Maris, but, um, but yeah, it is a mix uh, and not, not definitely a 50-50 ratio, uh, depending on what's needed in the, in the population of where they're getting released to. Um, something that was super interesting with those releases, particularly the ones uh, originally in 2013, those first individuals that were going to Mariah Island, um, as, as you mentioned before, around those behaviours uh, and with how um, you know, strong their jaw pressure is. Um, I think everyone's seen that captive devils can um, seem very vocal, seem aggressive, uh, and they're really not like that in the wild. And so captivity can sometimes, you know, devils lose their fear of people and they might start to associate us with food. So it was really important that we were making sure that we were choosing um, the right kind of behaviours of devils that were getting released into the wild. The last thing we want to do is have a devil um, approach a campsite and take a finger instead of a sausage off a barbecue um, or something like that. We want to make sure that animals that are getting released out there um, are wild type and are going to, you know, 
uh, survive and uh, live well out there. And so some of the things that were done was um, some behavioural testing. So it might sound a little bit strange, but uh, the devils were approached uh, by a camera um, and seeing how they responded to that. They were approached with food on the end of tongs. Uh, they were given some really novel stimuli, like a beach ball that was sitting on some um, dry dog kibble and see what do they do in that instance? Do they knock the ball off or are they like, mm, that's a little bit too scary for me, I might back away a mirror to see how they respond to another another devil. Um, and we're pretty proud to say, I think we tested almost 20 different juveniles that year and only one little girl just hesitated and then just quickly grabbed the meat off the tongs and ran away. So she unfortunately failed that testing, um, but everybody else passed. And so yeah, it was really interesting to watch how the devils responded to different things and help us learn a bit more about what behaviors might be suitable to release. Excellent, thanks Mon. And as Monica said, there's a lot of work that goes into monitoring the animals. Every devil is monitored after release and they're all genotyped. So we work with the University of Sydney who are doing an amazing set of genetics with the devils to make sure that the right devils go out, the right sex ratio goes out, that devils that are breeding really well that might end up having a few too much too many genetics out there and a lot of offspring will actually get contraception so that we can manage those populations and have the healthiest genetics for the future. So it's a really important part of the program. Now I've got a question for Latoya and that is when you do a blank search is the dog rewarded for not picking? Yes it does. So like I was saying it's just as important for the dogs to tell us when there is something there as when there isn't something there because we obviously don't want to be incorrectly um, pairing males with females. So yes if it's a blank search and they get to the end of the wheel um, they get a, a big reward because they've done an amazing job. So I think a lot of us wouldn't show up to work if we weren't getting paid and we don't expect our detection dogs to work to such a high performance level without getting paid either. I absolutely agree with that. More <laughs> treats and toys for all yes. of us. <laughs> the next question is for Monica and that's if you're successful with breeding a pair of Tassie Devils, do you keep them with the same pair next breeding season? Good question. Um, no, generally not, but it really depends on um, what their genetics is. Sometimes we might go if those individuals um, genetically are a really good match, uh, then they might be repaired. Um, but devils don't they don't seem to be uh, monogamous out there in the wild. They won't necessarily um, pair with the same individual. So it really comes down to genetics. But because, as Marissa mentioned before, we only have quite a small window in their age um, to breed. They only tend to breed at two, three and four years old. So generally what we might find is um, the males might be well represented. So that second year round, there might be actually other genetics that are more important to breed with that female so that we're not ending up with um, too much of that same genetics represented in the population. So really the repairing of the same individuals would only be for ones that, um, that their genetics is really limited across the program and maybe that would be a good pair. Generally it's new pairs every year. Excellent. And I've got a question that I can answer that's come through. So 21 days is very short for a pregnancy. Are there animals at the zoo with shorter pregnancies than that? Uh, and actually there are. So 21 days is a short pregnancy, particularly when you compare it with, say, an elephant at 22 months and with a person at nine months. But some of our fighting extinction species like mountain pygmy possums and eastern barred bandicoots are very short. So the pygmy possums are 13 days and the bandicoots are 12 and a half days. But the winner is actually a species that I've been lucky to work with for years, and that's the stripe-faced dunnart. It's a little relative of the Tasmanian devil, a small carnivorous marsupial that is about the size of your thumb. And their average pregnancy is 11.7 days and the shortest pregnancy recorded is 9.7. So they can actually be pregnant for less than 10 days making them much smarter than any of us. <laughs> wow. And we've got, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's really impressive actually. They're amazing little animals and big personalities for such a small animal too. We now have a question for Latoya. Those dogs are awesome, I agree. Is there such a thing as a best breed for conservation scent detection? 
Um, I think that's quite a highly debated topic. I personally believe no. So in our program, we like to focus more on the dog's behaviours and personality rather than what they look like in their breed. So as long as our dogs are highly motivated and really engaged with people and I love um, learning and being with people, then they can make it quite an amazing research detection dog. So I like them in all shapes and sizes. Excellent. And I've actually got another question for you as well, Latoya. Um, you're also passionate about your work. If the trial is successful, are there any other species at the zoo that you might extend the use of detection dogs to, to detect estrus and lactation? Yeah, if this project is successful with Tasmanian devils, then there's no reason that we couldn't extend it to different species at Hillsville Sanctuary. But that's based on what our threatened species biologists and what our zookeepers deem um, as necessary. We obviously don't want to be just training these dogs on different species just for the sake of it. We want to make sure it'll actually have practical um, real world conservation outcomes. So if our team believes that it would be useful, then we will be more than happy to train up a team of dogs for that project. It would be fascinating. Thanks, Latoya. And one of my favorite projects that I get to work with Latoya and Naomi on is actually a new one that we're looking at with broadtooth rats, which are one of our unbelievably adorable, chubby cheeked little native rodents out in the wild. So detection dogs can just be amazing in our captive breeding programs, but also finding our beautiful animals like plains wanderers and boar boar frogs and our little rats out in the wild too. I've got another question now for Monica. Um, have you had a favourite Tasmanian devil that you've been lucky to work with? Oh, there's so many, but um, can I say two? Um, I'll, I'll be quick and say two. My favourite has had to be a little little lady called Milana. I was very lucky to be her mum. Um, I hand reared her from a tiny little uh, little Joey um, to be a bit of an ambassador for our breeding program and to to connect people with devils and teach them more about um, about devils. And she just uh, absolutely won my heart and was cheeky and uh, just yeah, I would go in in the morning and she would lay down and, um, and at my feet and obviously some of the behaviors that, that we had in the relationship we had isn't um, isn't like a, a wild behavior but um, yeah I learned so much of her she was an amazing little devil um, and I know that so many people that come to the sanctuary today often um, remember Milana um, and uh, and so yeah she's pretty special but I'd have to say probably one of the cheeky cheeky ones that like what you said Maris with um, with the in the wild with setting off traps. Um, Elise, who's one of our devils we have right now, she is on display with um, with three little joeys right now. So if you're nearby to the sanctuary, pop in and see her. Her kids are troublesome little three boys at the moment. Um, and she just seems to outsmart us at every opportunity. If we need to move her, um, or we're setting up a, a trap or we're doing some training with her, um, she seems to just be able to go uh, just, yeah, um, outsmart us at every opportunity and I quite admire that. <laughs> I remember being in with Elise with you earlier this year and yes she is a very very smart little devil and very <laughs> cheeky she's just gorgeous. Um, well that's actually all we have time for so thank you Latoya, thank you Monica and thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope today that you have fallen in love with our devils and our detection dogs just as much as we have. So please do consider donating in the link that you'll see soon and joining us in protecting our wildlife so we don't ever lose those amazing little devil voices calling in the night. I know together we can fight extinction. I hope you'll join us for future webinars at Zoos Victoria. Thank you all and good night.